I was looking through the discussions kind of on perusal and I saw a few questions that were kind of related um, and I thought it's like well that's maybe something we haven't spent enough time talking about maybe it's something we need to actually discuss as a class and might be worth I kind of started taking notes and then realized well I probably need to turn this into a kind of short lecture um, so that's that's where I want to kind of start us off with is, is talking about some of those questions so let's go through some of those some of those questions and and if I, I I know that I haven't you know I know there's some more questions out there that I'd like to get to um, I was just trying to pull some ones that were maybe related and might answer a lot of questions uh, that I saw people were having um, so let me see if I can go there full screen can everybody see my slides now yep Okay. Yep. So here's kind of where the thread started. Um, you know, I think Paul, you posted this question. You know, what's all this fuss? We got all this fuss about saving space. Um, why shouldn't we just take? You know, why shouldn't we just start our primary keys as like small int instead of integers? Um, which for some tables is is an okay choice, but in general is probably not necessarily a great idea for a few different reasons. Um, so, you know, I kind of want to address some of these parts, you know, in pieces and, and, and why you might not do that, but also then talk about, you know, why is it maybe important um, to save space? Because that's another kind of discussion in and of itself, right? Um, so if you're looking at all the different data types, Right, we see we've got tiny int, we've got small int, medium int, int, and big int. We can see that they take up, you know, different amounts of bytes. They take up different amounts of space. The more space they take up, the wider range of numbers you can represent. Right. So with one byte, I can represent 256 different numbers, um, versus like with an integer, I can represent up to, um, if it's if it's signed, it would be like basically negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion or if it's if it's an unsigned number it's it's 0 to 4 billion roughly right um, so that gives me a lot of space to work with if if i say maybe i start with integers right so an integer kind of starts with with that um, another reason that we might part of the reason that we kind of default to ints or um, is because historically, um, when we're talking about processors and Windows and, and other operating systems, what historically has been kind of one of the most common um, sizes? Well, it's been 32-bit at the kind of architecture CPU level. Does that make sense? Or four bytes. Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of corresponds with what our processors can kind of do efficiently. Um, we've got 64-bit processors now. You've probably heard that term somewhere. Um, which 64-bit processors means they actually operate now with 64-bit or 8 bytes. Um, so our, our processors kind of run more on, on big ints now. So you could make that same argument, you know, that you used to be able to make on, on int because it's 32-bit. You can make that argument for, for big int now as well because, well, that's what a, a register, what our, our, our lowest kind of... Um, organization is in the CPU. So that's part of why the, that we picked those is kind of it corresponds with with CPU architecture. Um, but there's a few things to consider when we're specifically maybe talking about PKs or, or other things. Um, PK specifically, um, PKs are hard to change. I think Troy, you said this in one of your comments, right? Yeah. I think I had it right here. Um, it, it's really hard to change it, you know. If you, it, it's hard to, once you've decided on this type, um, you, there's a lot of things you have to do in terms of rebuilding the database um, if you make the wrong decision, right? You may have to go back and do a lot of rework, um, and that can be a big deal. Um, remember in there that your foreign case, the data types of your foreign keys, has to match up with the data types of your primary keys, right? So you're not just putting that data type, let's say I decide it's tiny int, right? 
I might be putting that in a lot of different tables, right? So if I have, let's say I have my, my customer's table, right? And I decide to make that um, a tiny int as the, the primary key, um, if I, or a small int. Um, if I say it's, it's that, and then I have three other tables that are connected to it, now I've got four tables where I have that, that data type decision. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if I want to change the, if I want to change that type, I have to change all four of those tables, um, which inherently means um, doing things like removing, um, first of all, you have to remove the foreign key relationships, uh, because if you don't remove the foreign key relationships, then you can't change the original table. And well, it turns out PKs, actually you can't even change the data type of the PK without dropping the table and creating a new one. Um, so usually what you end up having to do um, is this kind of dance to make the PK change, like um, potentially renaming the table um, to something else, creating a new table and then copying all the data over. Does that make sense where that might be a problem? Yes, I see that. It seems like with what's out there, it just seems like MySQL is just a super obsolete language. Like, why can't you just refactor it just like that? It, I, I get what you're doing. I, I understand uh -huh. what you have to do. You have to go into each create table and change it. And for something we're doing here with maybe like four or five entities, that's no big deal. But if you got hundreds or thousands, yeah, that could be a huge headache. But it just seems like the language be able to update. It's not a MySQL problem. It's not a MySQL problem. This same, what I'm talking about here applies to every relational database. So the same problem exists in SQL Server, exists in MySQL, exists in Oracle, exists in Postgres. Um, so it's not in the, it's not a thing in regard to um, MySQL's out of date. It's just that, that SQL, this is kind of how it works. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, so yes, I'm yes. We're talking about MySQL and we're working with MySQL, but this is not a MySQL specific question. Um, so, so what that all means is, you know, say let's say we change the, decide to change the PK, um, it means we really have to completely kind of wipe out the database almost and start fresh. Um, so that means, you know, completely rebuilding it and, and building scripts customly, you know, to, to do that process. Um, so it can, you know, take hours to days to fully, you know, to write out that process and test it and make sure it's going to work. Make sure that you don't lose any data um, because it's very easy. There's a lot of places where you can lose data if you do a big migration like that. Um, and then in reality, because we have so much data, um, that can actually then, once we've written it, can still take hours or days to copy the data to the new system, which may seem like a, a tiny, you know, it might seem like a tiny thing to say, well, this column, I want it to go from 16 bits to 32 bits. Well, um, it means really rebuilding everything, um, unfortunately. Um, so the decision you make ahead of time, not just for small databases, really, really matters because it is so hard to change. Um, so in reality, it's very infrequent that you will ever change a PK. Um, you basically want to be able to say, this is what it is, and I'm not going to have to change it ever. Does that make sense? That's the ideal. Okay. So another thing to keep in mind, so oftentimes your end users can add and remove rows. Right. So um, given that it can make it harder to also estimate how much space you really need. Right. So I think one of the things you'd said, Paul, is, well, you can probably fit it into 64,000. Right. Or 32,000. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Those are actually really small numbers um, in general. Um, if your users are able to put put or remove data into that, you will get to 64K in no time. Um, you can easily get to 64,000 records in a table in less than a year um, in a lot of different in a lot of different systems.
Okay. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. So, so one of the things to keep in mind, um, if I insert a row, remember we've made, made we've made these auto increment columns, right? Yeah. Every time I insert a row, it needs to get a new ID, right? Yeah. Okay. But it actually has to get that ID and reserve it before the row is actually in before the row is actually added. So what actually happens is it reserves the number and then it goes check is the is it a valid row? And then inserts it. So, so what that means is, is it before it can even, you know, check that the row is valid, it's already, it's already taken ID for you. Does that make sense? So, like if you've said that this needs to be of our car twenty, right? But they've given you forty characters, right? Well, that's going to go ahead and take an ID without actually inserting a row. You see that? Oh. So, so your, your IDs that are used, you know, for one, that can mean that you have gaps in your IDs. And it can also mean there are some IDs that you can never use because they were already reserved for an insert. Um, same, similar thing happens when you delete a row. A delete a row, you know, the data goes away, but the ID doesn't get freed up. So you may only have one between, you know, inserting, taking away IDs and, and deleting rows, taking away IDs. You may have a table that has one row, but that row is ID 2000. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so the ID has to take space of, of not just, you know, the actual data, um, but it has to, you know, kind of make room for the fact that data is being constantly changed. Um, so um, that's that's really something you have to consider. So let's say again, let's say we go to back to the small int case. Um, you know, if I get to a place where you know I've got maybe two records in a table, but those two records are ID thirty thousand, right? Then I may already have a problem with having them be small int. Uh, so um, notice that one of the things I said though here is is this matters if end users have the ability to add and remove okay so so that's kind of important um, so let's say you have um, a, a table of colors right and maybe you've got 10 colors in there but you, and this is for like our Caraboy boot store right you got 10 different colors that the the the, the products can be Right. Is that something that you want your end users able to add and remove colors? No, probably not. Right. So so because I have control of that and because that table really shouldn't be changed directly, I know basically that the numbers are going to stay small. Does that make sense? Or I can I can force them to stay small. Yeah. Um, so if it's something that the user doesn't have access to to change, such as that, you know, or if we're thinking about, you know, models or makes of cars, um, those kind of tables are fine to use a smaller data type for. Um, using a tiny int in those cases is OK uh, because the, you don't you don't have those first two problems. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the other thing to keep in mind, um, it's not unusual. It's actually pretty normal for the database that you create to be in use for, for quite literally decades. And there's a lot of cases out there where there are databases that, you know, maybe were written at the early two thousands or even in the eighties and they're still here, right? Companies are still using them. Um, they probably added on to them, added more tables and more data, um, but those tables that were created initially are still there. Mo, did you have something? I just needed to say, um, I just need to restart my computer real quick. It's like giving me like my Discord is like glitching out. Is that okay? I'll be back in like two seconds. So, so keep that in mind that you know this this database needs to survive. Um, for a pretty long time and it actually will probably your database will probably 
outsurvive your application. Does that make sense? So, so like they might have this database, you know, for 20 years, but they might change from say PHP to um, ASP.NET to Node during that time, right? They might have a bunch of different choices that they make on the front end, but their their database on the back end might still remain constant. which has kind of been one of the strengths of SQL is that you can keep it long term, longer term than uh, what the front end is. Does that help, Paul? Yes, I understand now. Okay. Um, so, you know, given that it needs to, to last for decades, that's part of the problem, um, part of why you need to be a lot more generous with your numbers. Um, and, and over those decades, ideally, you want the, you know, over that time, you want the database to be able to really be able to weather all that that's happening, all that activity without developer intervention. Okay, so this this needs to happen without you having to go in and constantly having to to fix it. Right. Or change the size of the of the column or, you know, maybe make all the numbers smaller so that there's more, you know, numbers available. Right. Um, so that's important because a, you know, that takes time to do and, and, and B, you know, there's there's just a lot of things that can go wrong with that. And there are some companies that maybe maybe you don't have a developer working on that that system. You know, maybe that's maybe that cell system was built 20 years ago and it still needs to operate. Um, but, you know, there hasn't been a developer working on it for most of that time. Yeah. So so when you're considering types and, and numbers, right, if the user has access to it, um, realistically, there's a lot of things that can happen that can grow those IDs up to millions in less than a year, um, if not a week. Uh, there's a lot of ways for that to happen. You know, from, let's say we insert a row every minute, right? That will get you very quickly to a million records, right? Um, or, which which can happen with a lot of different sort of logging data or, or time series type thing. Or if you're pulling, maybe, maybe you're pulling sensors, right, that are in our house that are measuring temperature, right? If you're measuring the temperature every minute, that's a lot of data, right? And that will mean your IDs get up pretty quickly. Um, or if you have a, uh, you know, anybody watch, uh, what was it, uh, Shark Tank? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, have you heard that uh, most, a lot of times they they find that their website crashes immediately the day, the day that their episode airs? <laughs> um, because, you know, things like that happen and then you all of a sudden you have, you know, a million customers jumping on your website, right? All trying to maybe order your product. Um, things like that can happen. You know, if you get on the TV one day or you get on a news story, um, you can go from having just a few thousand records in that table to several million in that table overnight. Um, so those those are things we really do have to plan for, right? We don't want the, the website to crash just because we picked a data type that was too small. Cool. So that's where I say, you know, start with integer. And, and honestly, most of the time I already jump up to, to big int just to really be safe. Cool? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, yep. Uh, the only case where I would use something smaller is if you know that the front end of the users, your customers, won't have the ability to edit it. Um, so the next question kind of embedded in there is, is does disk space really matter at this point, right? Um, if you look at how big your drives are, right, even just on your laptop, how much space do you think you have? How much space do you have on your, on your laptop for files? Like up to a terabyte from, you know, factory something. Right. Easily a terabyte. Probably several terabytes. <laughs> 
right? Yeah. Um, that's a lot of data, um, and 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 you know, at least from a, a, a user's perspective, from us, you know, a personal computer, um, it's pretty hard to get up to say four terabytes, right? Yeah. You can get there if you download all of your games from Steam, but <laughs> um, short of that, you're probably, or, or working with video files, you're probably not going to get to four gigabytes, okay? Um, I, however, let's say, let's say, you know, what I, what I just said, it's easy to get up to a million records in just a blink of an eye when you're talking about databases, right? Um, getting up to say four gig on a database is not that hard right um if you have just you know if you have a million users you're going to get there a lot quicker right because you don't have just one user you just have one user on your computer you have potentially millions of users on your website right yeah so so you know there's there's a scale question there where yeah um you probably you're probably pretty safe in terms of disk space on your computer. You might be concerned still about disk space on your server. Um, so so that being said, yeah, Daniel's got a a post of his. Yeah, that's still a lot. Mm -hmm. A few terabytes in there. Um, that's you know the, so that's you know space on a server is is actually really pretty cheap. Um, you can get you can get storage space for for pretty cheap when you're talking about working with servers. Um, it is worth noting that server hard drives are not the same as as the hard drives that you usually put in your computer um, because there's additional built-in um, stuff on them to kind of deal with errors because you don't want to lose your data. Um, so some of them may be set up to do automatic backups. They might be set up to be um, doing different forms of, of Stripe, Stripe kind of reading and writing. I forget, uh, what do we call that? Uh, RAID. Um, they might be set up with different RAID setups, um, and they're usually set up with some sort of redundancy or error checking, some CRC stuff. So the, the way that servers are set up, uh, means that that the actual hardware is more expensive than your consumer hardware, right? So it, it, to the level that maybe you know one terabyte of of disk in terms of hardware costs you, you know, let's say it costs you a hundred dollars for a terabyte, which you know it's not there right now, um, but let's say uh, let's say it's a hundred for round numbers, it might be four hundred for the same storage with server hardware. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so server hardware in general is more expensive, um, but there's there's just so much storage space available that that's not necessarily usually our concern. Um, does this space matter? Um, it does to some extent, but but large in part, um, it's not really a limiting factor. Um, generally, we'll cloud host things um, nowadays. With you saw we we started with Heroku. Right, and Heroku is built on top of, for instance, AWS hosting. Um, AWS hosting, they've got something called S3. Is it S3 or is it? I think it's S3 buckets. Um, you can get storage for ridiculously cheap, um, as far as as having having cloud storage available. So, um, talking about terabytes is you know is a is a really common thing. I mean, there are websites out there storing pentabytes of data, right? Not just terabytes. We're already at pentabytes, which is another factor. Flight Sim 2020. Huh? Flight Sim 2020. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so one of the questions that was one of the answer, one of the things you were saying, I think, Paul, you were saying that, well, Thinking uh, both you and, and Troy, you're kind of thinking about well, what about phones? Well, phones have have lower hardware. Or what about low end and laptops? Um, maybe they don't have as much storage space. Um, the reality is the 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 device that your your user is using doesn't actually matter when you're thinking about the database. Okay, the device that your user is using doesn't really matter, and and the reason being 
is that in general, they're not the ones that have the database, right? I don't want my database to be on your smartphone, right? I want it to be in the cloud, right? From a, so from a security perspective, um, we're going to generally hide that database behind our, our server and our web application. So they are the only ones that have access to it, right? Because I don't want my end users to be able to get in there and maybe steal passwords or other than their various things, right? Yeah. Um, so, so they're not going to have direct access to it. And, and because they don't have direct access to it, it really doesn't matter. You, the data types that you choose and, and such, the, the way you structure your data on the database, the hardware on the device is really not a factor. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because the hardware on the device never interfaces with it directly. Um, so whether you choose small int or tiny int or big int, it doesn't matter if the user is on a you know uh, an iPhone one or an iPhone three or an iPhone five, um, or if they're on you know uh, a laptop from 20 years ago. That doesn't really affect the decisions that we make on the database. Okay. Um, as I kind of mentioned, servers can have a lot more disk and memory space, and they usually do. Um, you know, the kind of numbers that we talk about on on client hardware are, are pretty much dwarfed by what's available from server hardware. Um, so, like, you might have maybe 16 gigs of RAM in your computer at home or your laptop. Well, there's servers out there that have a terabyte of RAM. <laughs> It exists. I'll show you in the next. I'll show you on the next slide. Um, you, you can actually buy them. Uh, there, there are servers that have a terabyte of, of memory, um, and you can get. Again, we're talking about. You know, there are there are systems out there that you know websites and such and databases that are using a, a pentabyte of of disk space. Um, so, so, so di when we're talking about disk space, disk space really is ridiculously cheap to die today, enough to the point that it really is negligible by large in part. Um, the cost that you pay for, for disk is so small in regards to kind of the overall picture that it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to optimize for disk space. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we... We don't really optimize for disk space. Um, on the other hand, we do want to optimize for memory because um, memory is still um, kind of scarce and expensive. Um, yes, there are servers out there that have you know a terabyte of, of memory or more, um, but yet generally when you're when you're hosting a server, especially through cloud hosting or, or virtual machines, um, you're going to find that what's available is actually going to be more in the range of one gigabytes to four gigabytes. Is what your servers actually run on. One gigabyte to four gigabytes, which should be kind of weird because, you know, if you if you look at the specs on your own laptop, you'll probably find that you have more than four gigabytes, right? Yeah. Right. So so you know there's there's a cost there to to memory, right? So there's not really so much disk space is not the thing we care about so much. Today, memory is still something we care about. Any questions so far? Nope. Okay. Um, so how about, let's talk about how much memory is available. So um, memory, as I kind of alluded previously, memory does matter. It does matter and is limited on, on servers. Um, if we're looking at your Azure personal computer or your laptop, even smartphones, a lot of them have 8 gigs and 16 gigabytes. I think, Daniel, you were posting yours, you had 32, right? 8, 16, and 32 are all, all pretty common right now. Yeah, uh, that's my server. <laughs> um, so, so I was just looking real quick to see what's out there. Um, and obviously, this is not the only company that sells them. But here's their, their listing for, for server prices. Okay, well, they've got, uh, you know, two options for servers. This server for, it's got a terabyte of, of, of RAM. Can you see that? Yeah. Terabyte of RAM. How much does it cost? Four grand. Four grand, right? Which might seem a lot to you, but from a business, that's really not that expensive. 
Okay, that's really not that expensive to get a, a big server like that. Um, or this one also is is forty five hundred. So so for four or five grand, right? About four five grand, you can get a you can get a server that has a terabyte of memory. Yeah, and that's Canadian dollars too. <laughs> that's Canadian dollars. <laughs> Oh man! Yeah, yeah. That that is Canadian dollars. Um, so so it's out there, and and where I say that that's not much. If you think about the average um, developer salary, this is like less than ten percent of their their yearly salary, right? The the cost of this hardware is a tenth of what it costs you to hire the developer uh, of the developer working on the the program for a year does that put things in context yeah so so the the cost of the hardware you know yeah you can get it right um it is it is you know that's that is to some sense pricey but for a business that's really not that not that much um, and and recognize that that hardware they can then use for many years. That's not just you know, hey, it's upwards 50, 60 k starting, you know, developer salary easily. Um, but that could be this could be easily a device that they're using for five plus years. Okay. Um, however. Um, when we're dealing with servers, we usually tend to share that memory across a lot of different applications um, using virtual machines. So we may have a server, we may have hardware that can have um, one terabyte of RAM, but that one terabyte of RAM is going to get divvied up into a lot of little chunks. Does that make sense? It's going to get divvied up into a lot of little virtual machines. Yeah. Who can explain what a virtual machine is? It's uh, basically a self-contained operating system operating within another operating system. Mm -hmm. And it kind of acts as it's got its own hardware, right? So when I set up a virtual machine, I get to give it as much memory as I want from the memory I have available, right? Now, if I say let's give let's run my app and let's give it uh 256 gigs of memory how many applications am i going to be able to run on that like four five. like four right right if i give it a quarter terabyte i'm going to be able to run like four applications right so if i make those if i make those vms smaller and smaller then i can run more vms so a lot of the hosting companies, they really want to run more VMs, right? Because each of those is a customer. Um, so they'll divvy up that, that large one terabyte piece of hardware into much smaller chunks, right? So you might have a thousand applications running on the same piece of hardware. Does that make sense? Yep. So we care about running, you know, servers that are, as it turns out, we care about running servers that are more lightweight, um, but actually we generally want to run more of them. So we usually run, run small servers, but run a lot of them. So I might say, you know, I want um, a server, you know, I need to have servers across the globe. So I might want to have maybe 50 servers across the globe. Right? I don't need all of those to have a lot of horsepower. I want those to be relatively lean. Um, so that's part of where you know I might do something with a lot less memory, for instance. So the the affordable kind of cloud hosting that's available um, at you know from AWS, from Azure, um, from Google Cloud Platform, their specs are about one gig to four gigs per VM. Okay, so that's where you get down to um, that one gig to four gig range because that's what the hosting providers kind of have split it up down to. Um, so because we're dealing with one to four gigs of memory, um, it really is is a limiting factor. 
with me? Yep. Any yep. questions? No, yeah. yeah, I've used AWS. If you want a lot of RAM, you better be ready to shell out the big bucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just to get, you know, if you want, if you want 32 gigs of RAM, you're going to spend a lot more per month um, than if you can run on on four gigs of RAM. Mr. Smith, I have a question. Yeah. Why don't most uh, most of the competitors just use like a uh, like the dedicated servers you can just buy online? What do you mean? If there's dedicated servers like from OVH and everything that you can buy, like why don't you? Why don't they just do that? Um, so, so dedicated servers, you're talking about having actual hardware, right? That takes up space, right? Well, no, it's virtual because like you just pay for a monthly subscription for it. But you're saying you get a whole a whole server. Basically, you're taking you're paying for a whole blade, right? You're, yeah. you're renting that whole blade. Right. Which what you're thinking is, is you're basically renting this whole device. Like it's all yours. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sometimes that is sometimes that's affordable. Um, but if you're doing what we call, you know, if we're doing cloud hosting, um, they don't they don't do dedicated hardware. Does that make sense? So, yeah, yeah there's a difference in hosting. Um, you can get from like GoDaddy has some get dedicated hosting plans and things like that. Um, but when you're doing dedicated hosting, it means that you have to kind of manage the hardware all yourself. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was just saying because like a virtual server, like a VPS mm -hmm. is what you're talking about is like right. they're they're generally like you they're more expensive to buy RAM on because like, you know. Right, but then you have to have somebody to maintain it, um, which means having network engineers and and other security specialists and and other people on staff. Which that cost alone of hiring and having all those people, the networking people on staff, can actually erode a lot of the the benefits of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so one of the things that you get built in with taking like AWS, for instance, um, AWS has network engineers working 24 seven, making things good. Um, so if something goes offline at, at midnight, right, you've got the engineers at AWS that are going to troubleshoot it. You don't necessarily have to have your own employees troubleshoot it. Right. So, uh I guess so. I, I don't know because with OVH they do the same thing, so I didn't know. Okay. Well, it's it's it does the different levels, right? So so there are certain things that um, they may troubleshoot themselves, and then there's certain things that they necessarily can't get because they only get so so deep in the stack, if that makes sense, right? Yeah. So if you own the hardware yourself then you have to deal with Windows updates and what version of Windows is on there and, and all those kind of things. Um, versus, let's say we're working with Heroku, I don't have access to the, the operating system itself, right? Yeah. So I don't have to worry about patching. It, with Heroku, I don't have to worry about patching um, Node. I don't have to worry about patching Linux, right? I don't have to worry about patching those, those kind of underlying pieces. So um, there's a lot of trade-offs there, but the the reality is um, that's the way a lot of the companies are going. Um, yes, there's there's dedicated hosting out of there, but most companies are heading more towards the AWS route. Does that make sense? And yeah, a big part of that is that a lot of companies don't have network engineers to necessarily maintain the system. That's actually really the biggest part of it is that they don't have the the other IT people there as much um, in a lot of companies, especially in the like the St. Louis area. OK, so given that we have that little memory to work with in general, um, does the memory usage matter? Yes, it absolutely matters, right? Yes, it absolutely matters. Um, but what do we use that? You know, what do we use that memory for? Um, so we use that memory for a few things. Um, in general, if you're doing, remember we kind of started looking at select queries, and and your the Code Academy tutorial went through that, right? 
Yeah. Um, select queries are used to get data out of the database, right? And get it into whatever format you want. Um, but anytime you run a, a, a run that select query, it's got to get the data, which is stored in files on the disk, it has to get it into memory, it has to load it into memory, um, which means that now that data that's in the database has to somehow occupy some space in memory for you to work with it. Okay. Um, so, so the more memory you have available, um, the more data you can deal with at once. Um, it also means if your if your data structures, the, the data that you have in your database is smaller, right, then you need less memory, right, which means you can have more data, right? If you use less memory, you can have more data. Um, if there isn't enough memory available, say that I have a, a, a table with, you know, 2 million rows and I can't load all of that in memory, or, you know, it's going to take time to work load that into memory, then the query gets processed in chunks. So it doesn't do the million rows at once. It maybe does a set of a thousand rows and then a thousand rows and then a thousand rows and then another thousand rows, right? So the data kind of gets more chunked um, if you don't have enough memory, um, which can end up meaning sometimes that your queries are slower, especially with more complicated queries that can end up slowing you down your, your data. Well, slowing down the, the query. Um, you also need to recommend recognize that your your so we talked about how how VMs kind of we split up the the hardware we split it up into different VMs but we're also then inside of our own database server inside of our memory we have to share that memory among all of the users. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you have a thousand users all trying to search for um, belts, right? Each of those are running queries. They all are consuming part of the database's memory, right? So, so what might start out is, hey, I've got this much memory available. You then gets cut down and cut down and cut down um, because I've got users and I've got VMs and I've got other things going on. Um, or the operating system may be taking part of that as well. Um, one of the things I can do, though, if I have memory available and I have small tables, um, one of the things I can actually do, I can take an entire table and stick it in memory, and that skips disk access. Um, so that's one of those places where a lot of times your, your database server um, actually really, really benefits from having extra memory, saying 32 gigs, right? Because they can say, okay, I'll take this this four four gigabyte table, right, and put it into memory, and then I don't have to go read the disk every time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so the more memory you have available to you, the more of that data you can keep in memory um, and not have to go read the disk every time you need it. Um, so in the end, what that means is with, with kind of all of these things put together, the more memory you have available to you, the faster your requests will be processed. Okay. The more memory you have, the faster your requests will be. Um, uh, which, you know, when we're talking about, you know, databases and such, yeah, the CPU speed matters a little bit. Um, but as it turns out, the, the size of your memory actually usually has more impact on how fast your queries are than your, your CPU speed. Cool? Yep. Because they're more memory bound than CPU bound, as it turns out. Okay. So, so does that answer kind of all the questions, Paul, Troy, anybody else here, as to why we kind of care about memory and are optimizing our our data type sizes? Yep. Yes, thank you. Okay. So so it's right. It's not about the disk. It's it's largely about the memory and the memory on the server specifically. Yeah. 
to backtrack with a little bit of history because it's worth putting all of that in context in kind of a historical context of understanding where we've come from and where relational databases kind of started okay so remember we talked about you know hey when we, when were uh, when did this idea of relational databases when was the first one created um, it's created around 1970 okay by this guy called Edgar F Cod at IPM Okay. How many years ago was that? 79. Between 1970 and today? 50 years. 50 years ago. Okay. So we've had relational databases in SQL for about 50 years. Right? About 50 years. Have a lot of things changed in the last 50 years? No, and they're still using servers from 2000. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, a lot of things have changed in terms of hardware and software. Um, we're talking about, you know, they were running things on mainframes um, in the 70s. We're talking about um, hardware was not what it was at this time. In fact, um, this is the the invention of the the relational database actually somewhat predates the first intel processor um, the first microprocessor so we're talking about still when this first was invented you know we're talking about still actually having you know computers that are size of rooms right and working with c um, that's the kind of world that we're talking about um, so, so things that matter around that time, uh, Intel 4004, which is the the first microprocessor, um, was was first you know created by was first created by Intel, um, and it had a clock speed of seven seven hundred forty kilohertz. Right? How fast is your CPU on your computer today? Four point eight gigahertz. Okay. So four gigahertz. How how many times faster is that than than seven hundred forty kilohertz? Kilohertz. Well, um, you've got kilohertz, right, which is a thousand. You've got megahertz, which is a million, and gigahertz, which is a billion, right? So so we got processors that are on a factor of a million times faster than the processors that they had in nineteen seventy one. Does that make sense? million times faster speedy uh, very very speedy um, we've got in terms of memory so this this CPU you can see it here um, only supported up to about 4k of memory that's all it could handle 4k of memory four kilobytes of memory right which is tiny by comparison to your normal your normal hardware right we're talking about bytes right when we talk about gigabytes we're talking about millions right so so we're on a factor of easily a, easily a million times faster in terms of both more in terms of the clock speeds and the the data the the memory space and the the drive space that they had at that time okay with me so far yeah okay um, this is what hard drives look like in the 70s. Beautiful. This is a hard drive. Okay. Now this is a, a, a this was a, a state of the art hard drive in the 70s. Like this is a fancy hard drive. This looks like it looks like it needs to be in a car, like in car engine. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, it's it's basically run by a car de car engine. You needed to kind of spin it almost. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, from what I hear, they made um, as much noise as a jet engine because they were spinning so fast and so big. That's awesome. Um, so you basically got a jet engine that you're, you know, is this is this is the thing that's storing your data, right? This is the thing you're putting your database on. Um, and you know, yes, if if one of those platters, one of those disks were to come out, um, yeah, it'd be kind of dangerous. <laughs> um, so, so, so this is this is the world that databases were invented in, right? 
Um, are there some hardware differences between then and now? Probably. Hard drives are a bit smaller, but just as loud. Uh, I, I, I have yet to see a laptop that sounds like a jet engine. I mean, I they can Mine be pretty like loud. I beg to differ. I <laughs> destroy that my computer sounds like a jet when it goes off. Okay. Um, Don't buy Razor. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're probably just hearing your fan and not the not the not the disc though. Yeah, I, that. Not my, I don't have a hard drive here, thankfully. So so this is a state of the art one, and sometimes they also look like this. Right? So you'd have a tape that's going tape. between between those two two wheels, right? We call that a tape drive. Uh, that looks like the old-fashioned movie films. Troy, don't you have one of those in your car for your radio? <laughs> it, 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 you're right, Sheridan, because it was the same technology. Um, the technology that they used for movies was the same one that they would use for computers. Um, it, it had these tapes. So you'd have a, a tape. Um, let's say you started where your database started at the beginning of the tape, right? And then the database ended at the end of the tape. Right? Would it take you a long time to get from the start to the end? Yeah, probably. It probably Correct. would. Right. And so if I have to go from the, the start to the end, uh, if I have to do things out of order, maybe, maybe I say I want record five and then 32 and then let's go back to seven, etc. Skipping around on the tape would be really slow. Right. Yeah. So I want to try to do as much as I can. I want to do all my reads and writes in order, right? I want to do them in order, and I want to have everything nice and compact and squished next to each other, right? I don't want to have a little bit of data over the at the beginning of the, t t uh, the beginning of the tape, and then have to go all the way, rewind up the tape all the way to the end, and then go read it there, right? Yeah. So, so databases were designed with these tape drives in mind. Relational databases were designed with tape drives in mind because that was one of the things that they used. Um, and it was used with these, which had some of the same sort of constraints. These were better, um, but they still had a lot of the constraints that those tape drives have. Um, and for many years, uh, companies have actually still been using these as quote unquote backups um, where they would say, well, we'll have the database on our, on our nice other drive, but then when I need to save a copy of it, right, to go back to have a history or a record, then I would put it onto one of these tape drives. So even just 20 years ago, there were still companies using using these as, as backup mechanisms. There's actually still companies doing that today. Yeah. I <laughs> They're really not good for backups, honestly, because there's so many things that go wrong with them, even just the tape tearing. I actually, I actually looked at it, and it's actually one of the cheapest, like it's cheap, top, like like per gigabyte per cent okay. squared. Yes, uh, but in terms of reliability and speed of access, it's yeah, pretty slow. Like yeah, yeah, it, it's still pretty. It's definitely pretty cheap. I would agree with that. Um, but in terms of you know the the odds that you're going to be able to recover your data or not lose your data, it's not necessarily a great thing ssds are actually better for for um long-term backups now than than tape drives are okay so to compare that right so we've got here's what it looked like in 1979 state of the art that's this drive here that we're looking at 250 megabytes it's all that that stores 250 megabytes Ouch. Weighs 550 pounds. <laughs> Ouch. Right? And costs tens of thousands of dollars, which is quite a bit if you counter encounter kind of inflation. Right? So so this this hard drive, right, was probably more or close to a, a developer, probably more than maybe a developer's yearly salary. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's the other thing to put into perspective. So um, this this drive that you have here, 
wouldn't have just been used by one user. You might actually have a, a team, your, your whole team of developers might actually be working on the one computer that this goes into. Right? So this might need a service, five, 10 people, that one drive. Okay, big difference um, versus, hey, we've got an SSD drive here, micro SSD, it's got 16 gigabytes. Um, well, that's a, a lot more, right? <laughs> a lot more. Um, and we're, we're looking at, you know, it weighs about um, not even a whole gram, right? Costs about 11 bucks for that, right? Big difference, right? This is, this is what databases were designed to work with. This is what we have now, right? So, so this is not a, a problem, like you were saying, this is my SQL problem. This is a, this is a SQL problem, right? This, the, the hardware is, is in a very different place than where it was in the 70s, okay? So the, the way that we think about databases has to be different. Does that make sense? It has to be different. Um, in a lot of ways, a lot of developers still kind of think about their databases and we think about relational databases, we still think about it this way, right? Because that was what they were designed for. Um, but we have to maybe think about the way we work with things a little bit different. So um, what they were designed for with those hardware differences, they were designed to do a few things. They were designed to minimize your storage space, um, both in terms of disk space and memory. Right. We needed to make things small. Right. We needed to um, save things in the smallest amount of bits that we could. And, and oftentimes they would talk about bits and not bytes at that point because you needed to be that small. Um, we needed to make sure that as much as possible, our reads and writes were sequential. Right. Think about that tape drive as opposed to what we would call random access. Right. You don't access them in a random order. You access them sequentially. You know from the beginning of the tape to the end of the tape or the beginning of the drive to the kind of the end of the drive right in and out and around tracks and things like that um, it's also important that the the, the drives were up a hundred percent of the time that uh, you would never take this offline you wanted this to be online all the time right so that's important um, and you wanted to prevent errors right you didn't want um, errors to get into your system, whether it be from the users, the developers that are working on the system, or your users, right? Um, because that would be a costly problem, potentially, right? So there are a lot of things were kind of the constraint. Um, it did need to be accessible to multiple developers or users at once. But when I say multiple developers or users, what am I, what kind of numbers am I talking about? Like, like what kind of developers? Huh? Well, you ask what kind of developers? No, how many? How many? Uh, I think you mentioned they might all be on the same computer. So, uh, so, so when I say that this this database needed to support multiple users, I mean tens uh, of users, right? On a normal system, yeah. it might be 10, 20 users, right? That's a normal, normal database. Needs to handle 10 or 20 users at the same time. Um, and maybe a large system, maybe if you're, uh, maybe if you're dealing with booking airplane, airline travel, airline tickets, right? You might still only have hundreds of users, right? So it did need a way to do concurrency but it was small scale concurrency, relatively speaking. Um, and, and it's worth noting in, in the 70s, actually, a lot of this predates the internet and the web. Right? When we're dealing with, with this, we're not dealing with a website. Right? We were dealing with, with terminals <laughs> would connect to this. Right? Oh. So, so there's a lot of kind of things you have to think about, you know, what was it built for, right? What was the system built and designed to do well? 
right? So if our problems look like that, and if we design our databases with those kind of things in mind, um, we're probably going to get more performance out of this system, out of this SQL system. Make sense? Yeah. And understand why they exist. Okay. So what we optimize today looks a little bit different. Um, processing time is a really big deal for us now, right? We want that, that turnaround time between the user clicks or tells something to happen or presses a key to when they get an answer to be as fast as possible, right? That's probably the, the biggest thing that we look at in terms of performance, right? How long does it take from the user's action to when they see results on their screen? Okay. Memory usage matters for us as matters for us as well. Um, there's still a difference between uh, one of the things that, that exists right now is that there's when you're talking about memory, right? Memory is generally faster still than the the hard drive, right? Or accessing files on the operating system. I mean, on the on the file system whether it be SSD or, or magnetic drives, right? It's generally faster to access it from the memory. So because it's faster to get things out of memory, we want to reduce the number of, of disk, access, disk accesses that we have to do. With me there? Yep. Um, we want to reduce, and that means doing things like having the, the table be in memory um, instead of the table being on disk. Um, so reducing the, the, the number of times we access the disk is important um, or how much we have to read still matters, even though having, you know, terabytes and terabytes of data on the drive is not a big deal. It's still a matter of, of how many times you access it is still going to slow you down. Um, the other thing that matters in terms of, you know, optimization is, is thinking about how many times, how many requests do we send to either to the database or the network? Um, because that data still has to travel from one computer to another potentially, right? Like from your 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 server to your user, or between even between if your if your web app is on a different server than your your database server, in your database that may still be a network that may still be a network request to get the data and get it to the web server. Cool. So, so those are the things you want to pay attention to. Um, is is really that's that's where we care, right? We care about um, we still care about memory, so we still care about processing time. Um, so sometimes picking a smaller file file, picking a smaller you know data type, whether it be varchar twenty instead of varchar one hundred, or whether it be um, picking small int instead of int. Um, that can lead you to um, benefits on, on both the processing time and the memory usage time, even if it, even if you don't necessarily care about the disk space. Okay. Um, another concern to keep in mind, um, nowadays the, the developer hours are actually a lot more expensive than the hardware. Okay. The cost to develop and maintain the system is a lot more expensive than the cost to um, buy the hardware to run it. Cool? Yeah, cool. So, so keep that in mind as you're kind of thinking about how you design it. If, if, it's, if it's a case where you're going to optimize it and maybe it makes it run faster, but it requires hours and hours of bug fixes and, and maintenance on your end, maybe it's not, a, maybe it's not an optimization. Does that make sense? If it if it optimizes how much space you save on disk, but then greatly de-optimizes how much time you have to do as a developer, maybe it's not a good a good choice, right? Okay. Anything anybody else has to say about um, hardware and, and history there? Kind of have a sort of history question. Yep. So 
um, you spoke about like a developer cost. Um, developers always paid a lot of money. Where does that kind of practice come from? What do you mean? Like, I guess it's a term of like the value of like a software developer, but the, I mean, they get paid, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases. Uh -huh. It just seems like a very high number to have for a developer. Not like underplaying what we do, but. Yeah. Um, don't, don't, don't put our numbers down. I like our numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for reference, in, in the 70s and 80s and such, kind of starting in the kind of early periods of, of computer science, um, it was actually the reverse. The hardware was expensive and the developers were relatively cheap. Um, it's actually flipped. And I, you know, I'm not entirely sure what's caused that other than the fact that the hardware just keeps getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Um, and developers just keep going expensive, more expensive, and more expensive. And I think that mostly is tied to like, you know, cost of living keeps going up, but the cost of, of electronics, right? Circuit boards and, and semiconductors that keeps going down. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of the, the one thing's going up and the other thing's going down is, is part of what's driving it. Um, beyond that, there's also been a supply shortage over the past, say, 20, 10, 20 years. Um, where there's a lot more developer jobs than there are people to to fill those jobs. Yeah. So so that's been the other thing. It's it's also a supply and demand question is the other thing that's driving it up. Yeah, I don't know if this is the right place to throw this out there, but if there is a oversupply of jobs and an undersupply of people willing to do them. Uh, that means uh, a mediocre developer. It's never been a better time. So it's yeah. hope for me. There's some, there's, some, <laughs> there's some definite truth to that statement, yes, um, in the fact that, you know, uh, because of how things have switched, um, it, it, if, if you look at kind of the average developer in the 70s, they were really, really smart people. <laughs> <laughs> They were really smart people, and they had been. They were people that had been um, working for 20, 30 years already, and they were probably either like a mathematician or an accountant or um, an engineer, a, a scientist, right? Um, they they really knew a lot of stuff and were were really smart cookies. Um, it, it's not necessarily as important today um, because. A lot of things have gotten easier um, and a lot of problems have been solved. And so um, design skills and your ability to work with people is a lot more important today now than it used to be. Does that make sense? So that those kind of are the almost the dominating factor um, rather than your mathematical ability nowadays. Okay, so we've talked about space. There are two other questions I wanted to per quickly look at, given that discussion on space. Um, so first of question is, how much space does null take up? And I think, Paul, you kind of read this sentence and said, well, uh, null takes up a lot more space, right? Yeah, something like that. Because um, this says, um, if I read the actual wording here, it says, in some cases... This is more convenient. It's more convenient to use zero um, than to use null values. Um, and they're saying it uses less data and index space, um, which is sort of true. Um, but the amount less that it uses is relatively negligible. Um, so the way that this works, basically, you've got a reserve amount of space for the actual value, right? So let's say your, your date or your number, your integer, takes up 32 bits or, or 4 bytes, right? So let's say I have an integer, right? 
Um, if I just have those four bytes for the integer, can I also store null there? Can I store uh, null in those same four bytes? No, I guess not. Right, so I have to have some separate way to store null, and that actually happens regardless of what your data type is, right? So, so if I want to store a string that is null, right? Is empty string and null the same thing? No, sure not. Not really. Oftentimes you can treat them as the same thing, but they're not technically the same, right? And sometimes you do care. Um, so, so when you say a column allows null, right, it doesn't not allow null, right? If it allows null, then we have to have some way to keep track of that. And the way we keep track of that is with a bit or a byte that is separate from the actual value. Okay. So if I want to store an integer, I need four bytes, right? If I can store, if I want to store an integer that could be null, I need five bytes instead. You with me there? Yeah, it ends up taking up more. Right. So to store that null value adds an extra byte, kind of in general. It adds an extra byte. To be able to store null, if you want to be able to store null anywhere in that table, anywhere, sorry, anywhere in that column, then you need to reserve an extra byte of data space. Um, so you can potentially save some space on the disk if you don't allow null. And instead you say, well, zero is my null instead of null is my null. Does that make sense? Yeah, that might introduce other problems, though, like averaging. Yeah. Okay. Well, because, for instance, then do I maybe have to change my code? Might I have to change my code to treat zero specially? Uh, you could have it ignored, I suppose. Maybe. Um, it may mean also that I have to maybe change my select queries, my joins and things. Um, so having kind of saving that one byte of memory that's that's there for null sometimes means uh, that while you do save 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 a little bit of, of disk space, you actually don't really save, in the end, you actually don't really usually save very much on memory, if at all, um, and you lose a lot in terms of developer time. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. The good of all this is that you can just kind of follow the rules, but it's good to know the reason why. Right. So why I would say yes, Yes, you know, yes, that can be an optimization to use zero instead of the real value. Um, but you're better off just use null, use null for what it's intended for. Um, so if you need to be null, you need a null in that column, allow there to be null in that column. Don't try to save yourself space by, by making it not null. Cool. Very good. Thank you. So it's, it's kind of an optimization in one direction, but it's not necessarily an optimization in terms of developer time. Um, next question was about blob and text. Um, and this has kind of occurred in two different, two or three different conversations, which is why I pulled them up here. Uh, so Darnell, you'd asked about, you know, hey, there's this idea of RCAR or RCAR max and text, you know, and when do we use each of those? Um, so RCAR we've talked about, right? Varkar says you can store up to this many characters. Um, yes. Varkar max um, is basically in, in SQL Server, it's shorthand for Varkar 8000 um, nowadays. Um, so that's really just a shorthand in SQL Server. It doesn't exist in MySQL. So there's no Varkar max in MySQL. Uh, you can still say, I believe you could still say varcar 8000, um, but eh, you may not want to do that. Um, 
So, so what's the difference between, let's say, Varkar Max and or or Varkar 8000 and and text? Okay. So when we're dealing with a Varkar, it's stored as part of actually the row, right? It's stored as part of the row, um, which then kind of affects the size of the row. Does that make sense? So you may be storing some extra data that's that's blank or you're not used, right? Yeah, yeah, that would present some problems, wouldn't it? Because it would just be like you might have something like age, birthday, state, yeah. something like that, and then boom, you got like a book in the next column. Mm -hmm. Maybe, um, but it, it, let's say I've got like Varkar 100, right? That means for like the name. Well, that means that every row has space built into it for 100. Right. Even if every row only uses maybe 20 characters of that, you potentially still have space for 100 in every row. That makes sense. So there may be some extra data or bytes that you're not using, um, which yeah. then can cut into your memory usage. Right. When you have to load that into memory. Um, so so choosing choosing a value there can mean you have extra you mean have, have have extra kind of unused spaces. Now, that being said, um, modern SQL databases, SQL Server, MySQL now as well, um, they are actually a lot smarter with how they deal with Varkar. So if you have Varkar 100 and you're not using all of it, it's actually smarter about how much space it actually wastes. So it won't actually waste the full 100 characters all the time you'll actually waste a smaller portion of that. And that's kind of a, a low level detail of how much it actually wastes. But there's been some there's been some optimizations on that. Cool. So it may not be 100 characters. If you'd say 100 characters, it may not be wasting 100 characters. It may be less. OK. OK. Now, a var car, remember, as I was saying previously, is stored as part of the row. All the data for the string is stored as part of the row. With text, the data is not stored in the row. Um, so basically what it does is it puts, when you're using a text column, you just have a number, an ID for, kind of for the string that says, the, the, this is the number for the string, but the actual data is somewhere else. So a text column really in the row only ever takes up about four bytes of space. Does that make sense? Even if I have a million characters in that text column, it only takes up four bytes of space in the actual row. Do you have that in your head? You can picture that? Yes. Okay. Um, so, so I say I only have four bytes, but in those four bytes, can I actually store those million characters? No. No. Right? So I still have to store those million characters. The trick is I store them somewhere else. So rather than storing the, the text in the table, I, tore, I store it outside of the table. I store it in, or, or after all the other records, right? So I store it somewhere else. I store it outside, uh, which means that it's slower to get to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And because it's external, I actually generally can't search it. Because so that's why it's better to use one color or text because you would have to do some external stuff with text. Right. So, so the benefit of using Varkar is that it's quicker to potentially search that. Okay. Uh, at least search it if you want to say equals or if you want to say like. Remember, if your where clause says equals or if it said like, then var car is, is better. Okay. On the other hand, if you want to do a full text search, text is great because the way full text indexes work, it actually makes that text column optimal. Okay, because then it goes to the index rather than going to the, the rows itself. You kind of with me there? Yeah, so it, it's more about how you how you use them compared to each other. Yeah, it's more about how you kind of use them.
So, so you, you have a little bit of trade off there where it depends on how you're filtering the data, right? So sometimes text is a good decision. Sometimes bar bar is a good decision. Uh, okay. okay. If you know that you're going to have something very long, you should probably put it in text and you should probably have a full text index on it. If it's a very short value, say, say 20 characters, 100 characters, you know, somewhere in that range, then I would use Varkar, right? If it's sub 100 characters, then, then Varkar is a great choice, and, and, and I would do that that way. Um, but if you know it's going to be potentially thousands of characters, you know, such as a whole article, then I would break it off into a text. I would say that's a, a good text column. Okay. Um, so next let's kind of talk about, so that's text, right? And, and I hope that kind of explains where and when to use text. Um, blob is kind of very similar to text. Um, the idea is that it doesn't keep the data in the row. So like binary, var binary, um, both of those store the data in the actual row. Blob says, well, let's just store a number here, just the, the four bytes number, and then we'll go put blob, the actual data, somewhere else. So text, um, both of those kind of behave very similarly in that sense. Text is only character data, like strings and such. Uh, blob is anything. Blob is a series of bytes. You can think of it as a, a long array of bytes. Cool. So anything you would store as an array of bytes, such as a file or, or other things you can store in a blob. Okay. Now, one of the things that sometimes people use that blob for is to store actual files, such as media, like images and video and audio and, and other things. Um, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> better to store the file on the file system. Um, rather than using a blob for that, it is better always, 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 always to store it on the file system. So that's where I would just say put the file name as a var binary, or, sorry, as a var car into the into the database, and then store the actual file on the file system. And and one of the reasons that that one of the reasons that makes that faster, there's a lot of reasons why it's really slow on a database to have files in there, large blobs. Um, but uh, you remember we talked about CDNs a few weeks ago? Yeah. Yeah. So CDNs are really good at doing what? Content delivery. Content delivery. What is content? Because we mean something specific by that. Files. We mean files, right? CDNs are really good at serving up static files. If you've got a file on your system, your CDN is great at, at, at serving that up. Um, they can't serve up any data that you have in a database. So if you have it as a file, then you can use a CDN to make it really fast um, to get that audio or that video or, or such. But you don't you can't do that if you put this stuff into a database. With me there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's where not to use blobs. Okay. Um, so let's talk about what you should use blobs for. So blob is used, on the other hand, blob and binary uh, are used for things like passwords, and password hashes, and salts. So when you're dealing with um, like the user's login credentials, their password, we don't want to store it in plain text, right? We want to store it in some sort of encrypted or hashed for preferably hashed right uh, which means that it's not a string but it's an array of bytes once we've encrypted it or hashed it it's going to be an array of bytes okay so so that's not a good fit for text or, or var car right because it's no longer text you with me yeah so your, your passwords shouldn't be stored as text. They should be stored as, as encrypted or hashed binary. Um, so that's where we'll often do those as blobs or, or var binary. Um, we might also um, say you have anything that's also other things that are encrypted um, that you might want to keep in the database for security reasons, 
right? We might still put those in as blobs, right? I might not want to put those out on a file um, if it's encrypted or, or private or, or such. I might not want to put that in a file because then it would be more vulnerable. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I might put it in there for security reasons. Those are the kind of, that's basically where you see blobs is for hashes and encrypted things. Um, text, same kind of, like I mentioned previously, good for blog articles, good for nude articles, recipes, etc. Anything that's going to have, you know, thousands or, or hundreds of hundreds of characters, um, it's is worth having it there. Um, but you may want to potentially take the, you may, if you have text columns, sometimes it can be more efficient to then actually take that table and break it into two tables where you have one that's kind of the metadata, the information about the table that's just um, your traditional kind of um, ints and, and boolean, ints and bits and uh, var cars, etc. And anything that needs to be text, you might push that off to a second table. Right. So you might think of an article, you might have the article metadata as one table and the article text as another table. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's that's another optimization you oftentimes see is is split those up into two separate tables because that helps as well. Um, it's worth noting. You know, we talked about blobs, right? I can move those to physical files and that's usually what I want. Right. If I take a text, if I take a text column and I move it to um, a move it to a text file, right, which I could do. Let's say I take your article text and I put it in a text file. I lose the ability to do any sort of searching on it. If it's not in the database, I can't search it. Does that make sense? Yeah. If the text is not in the database, you can't search it using SQL, um, which is which is a big deal. So it's it's still worth having text in there. Um, on the other side, blobs are actually you know you try to follow the same argument with blobs. Even if I if I have a blob in my database, it's still not searchable. There's no way to compare a blob in a where clause or with an index or anything like that. Um, you can't search for things based on the data in a blob. Okay. So they don't benefit. If you're using blobs, those don't benefit. They don't they don't follow that same argument that you need it to be there because you can search it. Does that make sense? So they they behave basically the same way. One is an array of characters that's that's separate from the table, and the other is an array of bytes that's separate from the table. But the way, the place and reasoning for using them is a little bit different. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Okay, that's what I have for this discussion here. Um, does that answer some questions in terms of thinking about how to maybe optimize your your database designs? Yeah. And what to think about. Yeah. Um, because that's kind of what I saw. It's like well you know, the original question of like, why do I care about saving space, right? So so that's what we're talking about here. Um, so the next thing I want to do um, is go to um, do, we're going to take the cowboy, um, cowboy Boots database that we started last week, and we're going to start making that into a node app and, and working with the database there.